ICD or, or atrial fibrillation ablation in case of uh, FPF. So the, 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 the question will be very um, fast regarding ICD because there is no, no indication for ICD in case of FPF. So, uh, so you, as you will see in my, my slides, I will not really address this question. There will be some cases for um, pacing, and we will address that. So the first question that you may ask me is, the, how does IF affect prognosis in, in case of FPF? Of course, as you see on the left from the European Society of Gui Cardiology guidelines, atrial fibrillation guidelines, that of course, AF affect prognosis, increase mortality, which is a, a, a ratio around two to, to, for death, increase the risk of stroke, and increase, of course, the risk of, uh, of left ventricular dysfunction. And then, as you see on the right figure, each of these factors, AF and FPF, in, um, uh, increase the risk for the other pathology. The second question that you may ask me that maybe FPF is not always FPF, and in some case, it's, uh, it's, it's patient that has been improved after medical therapy. They had tachycardiomyopathy. Maybe they had in the past uh, decreased ejection fraction, and now with therapy they are better, but they have F, F, atrial fibrillation and tachycardiomyopathy. And in this case, atrial fibrillation is in, in, is in the guidelines regarding if you have left ventricular dysfunction with patient with atrial fibrillation and you have arguments in, or in favor of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, Indication for atrial fibrillation ablation is the class one indication. The third question that you may ask me is that, and we, we addressed that in the in previous session with Professor Anker, is that we have now benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors in HFPEF, and how about benefit in case of patients that have HFPEF and atrial fibrillation? And if you look to the subgroup analysis of the two main trials, deliver and ample preserve, you will see that the benefit of, there is no, uh, uh, no, no, uh, no impact of atrial fibrillation or no anterior fibrillation of the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors, you may say even that the benefit is lower, is higher in this patient with atrial fibrillation. So of course, these patients should receive today an SGLT2 inhibitors. And then you may ask me about, do we have arguments to go to a rhythm control therapy for all our patients with atrial fibrillation with FPF? And in this case, of course, you can look to this trial, which is the AIST FNET4 that has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Of course, this is not a trial about atrial fibrillation. It is not a trial about FPF. This is a trial about early rhythm control strategy. But you may there are some patients, maybe between 10 to 20 percent of the patient that had atrial fibrillation ablation. And these patients, as you remember, were randomized between an early rhythm control strategy, including, including mainly medical therapy, but in some cases atrial fibrillation, but in the other group, usual care group. And as you see, uh, there was a significant benefit in terms of uh, the primary criteria and you reduce uh, significantly cardiovascular uh, death, you reduce significantly stroke, and, uh, and you re so the, the primary criteria was significant. So my, my idea is that in case of atrial fibrillation and HFPEF is to think about an early rhythm control strategy. And then you may ask me if in my practice I would choose drugs or catheter ablation for rhythm and weight control in atrial fibrillation with FPF. So I will not have randomized trial that, like you have in HFREF. In HFREF you have uh, Castel IF. And even recently you have Castel HTX in very severe patients which are uh, where, who are patients that you are actually discussing about cardiac transplantation. So if you look specifically to HFPEF, here is an abstract coming from the recently ESC Congress, and you see here in randomized trial, they evaluate uh, patients with HFPEF and you, with atrial fibrillation, 
and you evaluate the impact of atrial fibrillation, and you see that when you when you ablate this patient, you you improve their hemodynamics, you reduce their BNP, you inc you improve their quality of life, you improve your VO2 peak. So you have really some arguments regarding uh, impact of atrial fibrillation, but it is not uh, a morbid mortality trial, of course. But remember that your benefit in case of half perf with ablation is lower than in patient without heart failure. Here is a, a small trial that has been recently published. It's almost 100 patients, and they compare uh, patient without half perf and patient with half perf, and you see that, of course, recurrence of atrial fibrillation, hospitalization, cardioversion are more frequent in patient with half perf than in patient without half perf. So, of course, if we compare patients with half perf with patient with half perf, you will see that atrial fibrillation ablation has almost a similar efficacy with a, a, a significant uh, result in, even in terms of mortality. Probably that, that means that your patient with half perf should be proposed atrial fibrillation almost at minimum as atrial fibrillation with reduced atrial fraction and probably more. And if I focus on the, in the guidelines and to, take, to give you some simple message for your practice, if you look to, to this recently published update of the ESC guidelines on heart failure, you see that for half PEF, of course, diuretics, dapagliflozin, apagliflozin, and something very important is treatment of etiology and treatment of comorbidities, screening for etiologies, even if the level of evidence is C. So, it, so that means that if you have atrial fibrillation, you have arguments to go towards, propose the different therapies for your patient with half -PEF. And even if I go to the guidelines of atrial fibrillation, which are now three years ago, we are expecting a new update uh, next year at ESC, you see in the center, in case of half -PEF, you have the choice of giving an antiarrhythmic drugs, but antiarrhythmic drugs in this case is mainly amiodarone. I don't have dronedo and I have it, but it's not reimbursed in my country. Probably you don't use it and I'm not using it. So we have the choice between amiodarone with uh, its very high risk at the long term for your patient and catheter ablation. So in this case, you know that in case of recurrence, without half perf, without half perf, you can discuss and you have a class one indication to perform atrial fibrillation for patient after failure of drug therapy. And then they think that in this case, it's still the guideline. And of course, there you have still indication for even if it should be very limited uh, first line therapy because what you don't see in the guidelines, what you don't see in these guidelines that we always have to discuss the benefit risk ratio with the patient and even from a medical legal uh, perspective, as an expert, uh, you have always to propose to the patient the different options and to write it in your, uh, in, your, in your report that you already discussed with the patient the different option and not only think about first line therapy. And of course, if why first line therapy may be useful, because you have some kind of trials like this one, early AF is not an half perf trial, it's an atrial fibrillation trial. It's a first line atrial fibrillation ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. It has been done by cryo, which simplifies the procedure, of course, and you see that your your, your percentage of patients in sinus rhythm at one year was significantly higher. So, and to finish, of course, always think about maybe our pre preferred option is to propose uh, rhythm control, but there are some patients that may be candidate for weight control. And this is the patients on the right of the figure. You see that in some patients, even with half perf you can discuss to pace and ablate. And in this case, maybe physiological stimulation, left bundle branch spacing, or CRT, even if it is a class 2B indication, can be discussed associated with an heavy junction ablation. I would not recommend it as a first-line therapy, but I may recommend it for older patients. 
Of course, remember, in case of weight control, you have the different option with mainly beta blockers. So here you can have my take home messages here that in case, of course, of permanent AF, you have to think about weight control, about, and then about eventually uh, AV junction and CRT. And in case of non-permanent AF, your preferred option is rhythm control strategy. And in this case, you have the choice, but with the high risk at the long term, if you have a long patient regarding amiodarone, and then discuss atrial fibrillation ablation. And thank you very much.